Hey family, thank you for tuning into Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please go ahead and tap on that like button and hit that subscribe button. Wonderful episode today, the son of Elegua and Ifa. Today's guest is someone I know very well, someone I love very much. He is a priest of this Orisha. He is a licensed real estate agent and my son. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Danny Mercado. That's right. That's right. Danny, welcome. Of course. It's good to be here. Awesome. Can't wait to talk about your guardian Orisha and all the things you have going on. One of the things we're really trying to accomplish is give people an idea of what your experience is like, right? So the first thing I kind of want to get into so people kind of get an idea of who you are, where we're from, et cetera. Um, you know, where, where are you from? I'm from, I was born in New York, the Bronx, but spent most of my life in, uh, in Florida, Orlando. Awesome. And what's your background? Background, like uh, what I do, what I like to do. No, just, you know, where you're from, like what, what were some of the things you're into, like, you know, growing up and whatnot, you know, ethnicity. Yeah. So I'm Dominican and Puerto Rican. I'm mixed. And, um, I grew up doing. one of my hobbies would be fighting. I grew up fighting. Awesome. So, yeah, we're going to delve into that now because when we look at El Egua, um, his experience or y'all's experience is really unique because apart from being the son of the most important Orisha, that comes with a lot of responsibility and a lot of, you know, things that go into that right so just to start off there's a story about El Egua that speaks of when um his mother um who was a single mother oh yeah had him at a very young age and she ultimately left him up for adoption because she couldn't really handle the responsibilities of raising him so she really kind of just left him on the road and El Egua was a really miraculous kid because he, you know, was speaking at a very young age. He was walking at a very young age. He was, like, prodigious, you know? So one day, he runs into Obadala. And when Obadala sees this young kid in the middle of the street, he got nervous. He's like, oh, my God, you know, what are you doing here? And he took the kid in, and he started raising him. Little by little, Elegua kept growing. The years go by. And Obadala loved him completely. And Oya, being an older woman decides to try to find a way to get back into her son's life. So she went searching far and wide, and she arrived at a place where she thought he might be near where she left him, and she was like, oh, my God, you're my son. And Elegua was pretty traumatized because he's like, good Lord, I don't even know who you are. And then Obatala came out, but what Elegua didn't know was that Obatala was Oya's mother or his grandmother. So it was a really wild scene and Obadala and Oya started arguing because she was like, well, I birthed him. She, The other one was like, well, I raised him. Where Elegua had to kind of look at both of them and say, hey, you're both my mothers. I both appreciate you and love you. But we need to live in peace as a family because we have a lot of things to catch up on, right? And just like that, a beautiful family dynamic occurred. So my question is, is, you know, do any of these situations resonate with you? God forbid. Um, any situations of homelessness? Were you raised in a single mother household? You know, if you could delve into that. Yeah. Um, I was definitely raised in a single mother household. Um, my father wasn't there when I was born. He really wasn't there for most of my life. And um, it definitely resonates with me because it's a very similar uh, situation, you know. Um, and then later in my life, my father does try to get in contact with me, but we don't exactly see eye to eye. So. And, that, and that's understandable because, you know, as you grow older, um, you look at certain parallels and situations, things you might have done differently, whatnot. Um, so that's completely natural as we progress into, you know, adulthood as men. Um, what was your relationship like with mom growing up? You know, what is what has she represented to you? 
Um, she was, she was the pretty much the, the leader, the person I, I looked up to. I trusted her word, and uh, everything I did. If she suggested something, I did it because I trusted her, and um, she was really just the the only one there for me. I mean, other than um, a lot of my family, which was good as uh, we had a good connection as well. But my mother was definitely the one I looked up to, and and we had a good relationship. What are some of the things you can remember from, uh, you know, the homeless situation? Like, you know, whether it was not being able to transport yourself or, God forbid, the shelter. What What are some of the things you can remember as a young man? Yeah. Um, I know I was in a shelter for a time, but I don't uh, remember it. But I do remember uh, a time where um, it was me, my brother, and my mother um, on the sidewalk. And we didn't have any type of transportation, a home, or, or really anything. I remember us uh, just uh, mesmerized by, uh, you know, if we had a, a car, it'll make it a lot easier on us. And um, that's really one of the things I could remember about us really not, not having anything and wanting to, to maybe start with maybe having a car and then a house and all that. How has this motivated you as you bec- you becoming a man now and ultimately a professional you know how have these experiences kind of shaped your work ethic you know as you're moving forward in life yeah um i don't regret anything i'm, I'm happy uh, about whatever has happened to me in the past because it, it has made me who i am today you know i'm a professional uh, real estate agent i'm an mma fighter and uh, i'm a high priest i'm a spiritualist so um i'm highly skilled in a lot of areas I don't. I don't regret anything. I'm happy about what what happened. It shaped me to who I am. And I'm, a, I'm a fine. I believe I'm a fine young man. So you definitely are. You're not killing nobody. You're not in jail. I think you're doing all right. You know. And apart from that, you're excelling in so many different areas. It's interesting because in this same sign, it talks about that father son relationship, right? And um, you know, it, it speaks of when once again Elegua was separated from his father at a young age. Because Elegua's father and his mother really weren't seeing eye to eye on certain things. So it led to Elegua being raised with his mother. But as time went on, he wanted to understand who he was and where he came from, right? And he went to his mother for answers, but his mother explained, I can't give you the answers you're looking for because they weren't my actions. Visit Orula or the Baalao. And see what he has to say. And when he visited Orula, divination was done. And Ifa said that he needed to perform sacrifices in the next land over. But he didn't realize that's where his father was king. His name was Eshu Laroye. And when Eshu Lario, which was the son's name, arrives in the next land, he sees a man doing witchcraft to everybody. And everybody was like all afraid of him and terrified. And Eshu came in, Eshu Lario came in with the offering of the gold and the you know, the rooster, et cetera. And when Eshu Laroye saw this, he ran up to him and said, who's this for? He said, I really don't know, but I'm looking for my father, right? And the guy kind of looked at him and said, man, this kid kind of looks like me. And he started asking and inquiring and things like that and he realized, oh my God, this is my son, right? They embraced. Eshu stopped doing brujeria to people and witchcraft to people and peace came. And they didn't always have a perfect relationship because we're not always going to have a perfect relationship with our parents because we're human beings, but they were civil, right? I ask you this because coming from a single mother background, going through hardship as you guys did, um, how does this motivate you to be an amazing father when you choose to create a family? How is that going to affect your choices? Yeah, um, it definitely affects how I make my choices because now I know how it feels to not have a father. So now I know kind of how I want to raise my kid, how I want to teach him certain things because, because of my mother, um, she taught me a lot of good things on how to treat people and, um, how to love and basically how to go through life. So, um, with my mother teaching me these things, um, I feel like I can, teach my kid and put my kid in the right direction um, with the father being there, unlike me, who didn't have the same scenario. Yeah. And it's incredible how from these women we can learn so much about what it is to be a father and, and a head of household. You know, and your mother has 
done so wonderfully, you know, throughout you all's lives. Um, it's interesting you mentioned the MMA thing, right? Because obviously, you know, you can see you have a definitely have a fighter's physique. And Legua was a fighter. Um, ironically, he was actually the guy who manifested boxing and martial arts in general, you know. And in the Odu of Obeyono, right, um, Eshu was getting bullied. Because the other Odishas, they would talk crap to him and they would, you know, kind of sun him because he was smaller. And, um, you know, El Igua was getting really tired of it. So he went to visit Orula. And when he saw Orula, he said, I'm having this dilemma and I'm really getting tired of it because I'm going to flip out. They did divination. Obeyono was revealed where Ifa told him he needed to perform sacrifice to become the king of Orisha. And so that no one would ever mistreat him again without him being able to defend himself, right? And Orumila actually taught Eshu martial arts. So the next time when people tried to, you know, play him, and Legua said, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, I'm going to fight each and every one of you one by one, and I'm going to win. He fought 401 people straight, and he wrecked all of them. Wrecked them. Yeah. And it was, it was really crazy because he was shorter, he was thinner, he wasn't really imposing. Like, you look at guys like Shango and Ogum, you know, they look like, I don't know, Naganu and, you know, Lesnar and all these guys. And Eshu was just handling them, right? So I ask you, um, you know, because we're, we're definitely against it here, you know, did you experience any bullying as you were, you know, growing up? Yeah, it's funny because I started fighting because I was, uh, I was bullied. Yeah. Um, so it, it mostly happened in school. Uh, I'd say maybe started in middle school. And uh, I started, I started to grow confidence. And um, that's something else that shaped me to who I am is, is fighting. I still do it. Yeah. Um, You know, I plan to do it very seriously uh, sometime in the near future. But, um, yeah, it's funny because um, it happened to me in that way, really. Um, people were picking on me or bullying me, and I was small, you know. I, had, I did have a, a very small frame. I wasn't as tall, and, uh, yeah, I was getting picked on, but until I stood my ground and, and, and showed who I am because of what I've learned in fighting, it, it didn't really happen anymore after I showed these these people who I am. So. Yeah, and, that, and that's really what leads to that. You know, either you're going to unfortunately kind of retreat into a shell you know because you don't know how to handle it or you're gonna you know train and prepare yourself not to hurt people but to be able to defend yourself because everybody has that right right um and like Gua loved fighting he was the best fighter period um you know what does fighting represent to you and what does it give you like what what satisfaction does it give you you know to go through those 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 trainings and those processes yeah um i think fighting is incredibly important um just for uh, life lessons, determination, it teaches you. You keep going to the gym, you keep going, you, you keep getting better. Um, same thing with life. You know, you keep doing things, you learn, you grow, and you keep doing it. That's how you get better. That's the only way to get better. So determination is one, you know, um, discipline. And um, hard work, hard work, reaching your goals, you know. And um, there's a whole lot of benefits to fighting. I completely believe in if uh, if anybody's even just trying to get in shape and, and they don't want to fight, I join a gym because it, it teaches you a lot. Discipline is very important in life, not only in fighting. So it's a lot to learn. It's a lot to learn. I think another big thing is humility, you know, because when you know you have that kind of power, it causes you to take, you know, life very seriously because you could have somebody else's life in your hands. You know, are you planning on teaching your children? Are you going to teach your sister? Because I don't want her to beat me up, bro. Like, I don't want her to handle me. But is 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 it something you're planning on imparting in your family when you create it? 100%. 100%. Um, for my kids, male or female. You know, of course, um, I'm going to support whatever they want to do, whether that's – it could be anything. It could be music or if my daughter wants to do ballet, whatever. But if they're growing up and they don't know what they want to do, I'm definitely going to put them in a gym just to teach them them those uh, basic um, life lessons. So yeah, and skills. Skill, you know, defend yourself in school because I know bullying is you know, people, unfortunately, they uh, you know, commit terrible acts when they when they get bullied. So 
And uh, when you learn how to fight, control is a big thing. Control. Because you have the ability to hurt somebody, but you either choose not to because of the situation or whatever it is. You don't just use it. You know, you have to, you have to know when to use it. So 100%, my, my, my kids will, will be in some type of sport if they don't know what they, what they would like to do yet. Yeah, and that's definitely a great inheritance, a great legacy. And it's something they're going to use forever, you know, as, as they walk through life. Because when you learn those kind of things, you don't just learn how to defend yourself with your hands. Learn how to defend yourself with your words, your conduct. It, it, it really avoids a lot of situations in general. And that's why Elegua really wanted. He didn't want to beat everybody up. But unfortunately, it came to a point where he's like, either I'm going to live like this for the rest of my life or I'm going to make a decision and, and change things. So it makes perfect sense. Elegua was an interesting guy because he was all about the bag. He was always getting money. He was a businessman. Um, you know, there's Patagis that says Elegua went into business with uh, – Ochung, Oya, and Yamaya, and everything was going well, right? But then they stopped paying him. Then everything went horribly because he made all of their clientele go somewhere else, right? Um, there's old dudes like Otruponca that says El Egua is always outside the house. And Osala Fobeo says, you know, Eshu is always, you know, right there at the entrance of the town, you know? So why am I bringing up all these points? Because you have your real estate license, you know? Um, you're a professional... You know, and Legua, this was kind of his thing. He was always making money. He was always buying homes. Um, what really motivated you to get your license? Um, well, this kind of goes back to um, my mother having an, uh, an influence on me because she um she basically told me, like, you know, you you want to um you know move out or, or have a successful future. Um, you know, real estate is a great thing to get into. You know, and my, and my mom w- was a estate agent at this time and um you know she was like yeah this is where the money's at you know if you just put in the hard work and uh, that's what i'm trying to do right now you know i got my real estate license not too long ago and um you know, I'm, st- I'm still working on it but uh my mom did have an influence on me on uh on real estate and it's, it's going good it's a process yeah and you're, you're learning quickly you're growing in leaps and bounds and you know how are you feeling about it as you're learning you know how how is it making you more passionate about what it is you're going to be doing for people because you're not just selling them a house you're, you're you're helping them buy a home and create a family so what is what's going through your mind as you're learning and going through your trainings and meeting people um well as i do certain things like open houses or i speak to clients i realize that it's not as hard as people say it is, I, I feel like I can definitely, if I put in the work, get the job done and uh, help the common day-to-day people find their homes for their families. Yeah, that's that's incredible because Elegua was all about the house. You know what I'm saying? He, in the Odu Ogundadio, he helped Obatala build a house. Um, you know, as far as business and, and Obatacana, he helped um, Oya sell, start, yeah, Maya start a fruit business. Like, he was all about transactions and things like that. And then another thing is, it's like you said, it's not that hard to talk to people. But if you're not prepared, it can be very daunting, whether it's doing a podcast, whether it's selling a home. But Elegua was all about communication, and he was very good at it, you know. To get into the romantic aspects of things, right? Because the son of Eshu by nature is going to get a lot of attention from a lot of different places. He's around a lot of people. He's going to talk to a lot of people. Everybody's going to like him, you know. In the Odu of Obade was where Eshu and Oshun got married. And thus Eshu Ajay was born, right? So they were a perfect match for each other. You know, um, you're in a relationship, right? Yeah. So, you know, as you're moving forward into adulthood and creating your life, you know, how important is compatibility with relationships, you know, as far as finding an ideal partner and being able to move forward with them? Yeah. Um, so compatibility is very important because you don't want to be with somebody that, you know, maybe you don't get along with or, you know, they don't make you happy or they're not fulfilling their role or they're not supporting you. It's very important. You know, there's a lot of aspects to love and, and relationships. You just got to find um, that one, you know, and our relationship is going quite well. Um, for the sons of Elegua, getting a lot of attention is very true, at least for me. Um, I do get some attention. Yeah, you're surrounded by a lot of people all the time, you know, socially as well. I mean, you know, you have videos that have 20,000 views, 25,000 views. Just you 
saying 10 words and people are like, wow, that's amazing. You know what I'm saying? Um, now, from the romantic standpoint, you know, have you ever dealt with that incompatibility and how were you able to deal with it, you know, before you were able to ultimately move on? Yeah. Um, I've had a, a couple of relationships and um, they were, there was always something wrong in the <laughs> relationships, to put it simply. Um, so that's why I say, um, that's why me and you agree compatibility is very important because we we didn't really have all the aspects we needed in 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 my past relationships you know it was there was always something wrong or you know just you know not the compatibility wasn't there well it's like it's like Ogun Namedi says when when the son of Elagua is excited there's no woman that can resist him you know what I'm saying so not every not every one that doesn't resist is is ideal so you know and and you look at Odu's like Ikabe Mi, it speaks of when Yemaya was uh, married to Elegua and they couldn't have been any more incompatible. She kicked Elegua out of the house. You know, they told each other off. You know, they just kept it. He just was like, whatever. And he moved on. So to all the brothers out there that are kind of like, I haven't found the one yet, it's unfortunately part of y'all's process, you know. But when you do find a fabulous partner, stay there, you know, because you don't want to get involved in the self doubt and, you know, looking for something when you have it already. So. The, the son of Eshu, in, in my opinion, it's not that you guys have it easy, but you guys are very lucky. Like, things work out for you guys, you know, whereas opposed to me, maybe I have to plan 100 hours to get something accomplished. You might just wake up, scratch yourself, and things will just work out perfectly. You know what I'm saying? It really is, you know. Um, when you look at Odu's, like, let's say Oturasa, right, where Elegua's son was in a ring of fire, and, you know, Elegua did this huge, like, plot and, like, plan Mission Impossible thing to save him. And everyone was like, wow, that's like a one in a million thing, you know? But it happened. So I, I ask you, do you feel lucky? Have you experienced those things? And, you know, what, is that, what does that do for you? Does it cause you to be more loose? Does it cause you to be more, you know, reserved or more careful? Like, how does that work with you? Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, the child of uh, children of, of Eshu or, or Legua, we are very lucky. I've had a, a lot of moments where I was lucky, almost lost my life a couple times, and, um, you know, very low chance, and, and you know, I was okay. And um, also, it, uh, whenever I go fight, you know, um, I have that luck, I have that. I have that Elegua energy with me where a lot of things are easier, you know, um, and that is the truth. I do agree with that. Um, we are very lucky. And, um, yeah. What are some of the health conditions that you've overcome up until this point of life that, you know, were scares? Um, one of them, my, uh, my appendix actually exploded. Yeah. When I remember I was, that story. Uh, yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Very young, very young. Um, they tried to send you home, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll give a, a short story. Yeah. Um, my mother was uh, basically, um, you know, l looking at me, and I, I, did, I looked sick, pretty much. But I looked a lot sicker than usual. So she took me to the hospital, and um, doctors checked me, and they basically told her, my mother, that um, I was just, I had a cold, and that uh, just to put me to sleep. And um, my mother caused the scene, and so I guess the head doctor came um he checked me he basically told the other doctors that um it's an emergency situation i i had to get sent to the emergency room immediately because i didn't have a lot of time left basically uh when my appendix exploded poison went uh all over inside my body i could have went septic jesus and um they were just gonna send me home it was new york doctors bro <laughs> new york doc they would have sent me home i would not be here so yeah, not all New York doctors, but definitely those, you know, whatever hospital that was. And remember, you caught COVID. Yeah. You know, that was rough, you know. And uh, what else happened? There was another near-death experience with you, I forget. Um, it's been like three or four. Yeah, it was like three or four. It was COVID. There was the appendix. Yeah, there was uh, one. Um, Your foot almost fell off <laughs> from the gym. You know, the pinky toe was about to fall off. Yeah, it broke up. A lot of my fingers. We broke some fingers, you know. Yeah. 
I tell you, but it's just yeah, he's he's a walking he's a walking <laughs> mess, bro. I tell uh, you, when uh, you have teenagers, <laughs> Phil, like yo, you just you just you just hang on because I'll I'll give a story here, like yo, like Danny comes to his mother, right? I'm on the couch and mom, I gotta talk to you. You know, no one talks to me. I'm dad. No one's like you just leave him alone. I gotta talk to you, right? So he goes upstairs. Erica comes running down. You gotta come look at this. I'm like, I don't want to look at it. He doesn't want me to look at it. You know what I'm saying? He pulls his pinky toe to the side. I'm like, oh my god, we gotta go to the doctor, bro. The pinky was about to fall off. But you know, with the fighting and stuff like that, bro, the stuff they catch, what it ended up being MRSA, right? No, it was a um, athlete's foot. It was athlete's foot, but it was yeah. like it was like right there, bro. Like they bad. took a sample. They're like, they're, he's one like bacteria away from like losing it all. So. That's the thing you go through with boys, man. But it's just it works out for him. Like he'll take it right to the brink, bro, and then yeah, a little shot, and like nothing. You know what I'm saying? So it makes a lot of sense. But it's interesting you mentioned the stomach thing, like with the uh, the appendix and and whatnot, because there's an issue known as issue la boni, and this issue. He really wasn't spiritual like that. Like he didn't like to like practice ifa and like that. He would do his own thing, um, but. One day he started getting like crazy stomach pains. The sons of Eshu by nature, their stomach is a mess. Like the way they eat, their diet, etc. Because you look at Eshu, Eshu eats everything. And the Odu of Eyobe, Eshu would just open his mouth. He was the garbage can. You know what I'm saying? So he started having really bad stomach pains. And he went to visit um, Orula with his mother, Oya. Where Orula said, bro, the only way to save your life is uh, you have to do Orisha. Like you have to crown. And he's like, I really don't want to do that. Like, that's not my thing. And he's like, it might not be your thing, but you're going to die. So they had to rush him into the room. They saved his life. You know, he started, you know, fixing his life and, and whatnot. Then apart from that, you look at Odu's like Iwariwobe, where Elegua's son got initiated, even though he really wasn't trying to be like Super Bowl Lao or anything like that. You got initiated pretty young now. I think, how old were you when you, you and your brother got crowned? At least you? What were you? 15? Uh, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Because I met you guys when you were finishing your year. I want to say you were 16 and your brother was 14. So, yeah, you were 15 years old, man. I mean, what was it like um, going through the crowning process? You know, like, what what were you feeling? Like, what was that experience like? Especially going through it at such a young age. I mean, I did Odisha when I was 22. So, imagínate. Yep. Um, well... Since when you're doing, when you're getting crowned, you don't really know what's going to happen. You know? mm-hmm. Nobody could tell you. You, you just kind of got to go through it. You got to trust uh, whoever's working it. And uh, who I trusted was my mother, again. Yeah. You know, she told me I should do it for my protection, for you know my life, for my future. Trusted her, did it, and, um, you know, ultimately it paid off. I have a lot of uh, situations where I think that if I didn't do Orisha, I don't really know what would have happened. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you look at you now, I think you got a, you're going on seven or eight years, like, you're really, like, getting, like, you know, itchingly close to being, like, an elder as far as years go, you know, um, and it's really refreshing because you don't see people your age, like, in your position, you know, so, I mean, what would you say to other people, your age group, that might be in the same situation or might be thinking about getting involved, because it can be pretty scary, because when you look at a Baalao do a bo or you look at like a Madrina Crown of Santo, it seems like a lot. Like what advice would you give to those people that are scared? Um, you just gotta trust it. You just gotta trust it. When you're going in there, you know, you just gotta know that you're doing it for you know, for yourself, you know, for your future. And um it really does help. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's protection. It's protection. It helps you uh progress through life. Whatever you wanna do, it'll help you. To help you progress and and you mentioned mom being you know such a huge mentor to you being such a huge role model and just a fabulous woman um you know the, the son of elegua was a really he was a really intelligent guy he was a really talented guy but the biggest frustration he would have sometimes is when he didn't feel like he had guidance because it caused him to have to make decisions on his own. And when you don't know what you're doing, you usually make a mistake. When we look at the Odu of Owani Tanchela or Owani Iwori, it speaks of when Elegua got initiated as a Babalao by Orula. And he was amazing. 
He was learning. He was doing well. But the problem was is Orula lived in another land and Eshu was moving somewhere else as well. So when Eshu went to the new land, he kept practicing Ifa, but he was making mistakes because he didn't get a chance to learn everything he needed to. So it, it caused friction with people. Elegua abandoned his home. They had to go get Orula to explain to him, hey, you left this guy halfway and he's going through situations where Orula had to go perform ceremonies to Elegua. Shango was there, I think. Odua was there to be able to cleanse him of all the negativity that had come and then finish his training, you know. Um, and everything went well after that. He learned everything he needed to, and he was just great at Ifa and whatever he did because the son of El Agua is pretty much good at whatever he chooses to do. So I ask you, how important has that mentorship been, you know, and how, how much did you strive for, look for it? Because, you, you, you know, we all need it, but the son of Eshu needs it quite a bit. So, you know, how important has that been, that mentorship and guidance from whoever? Yeah, uh, I do uh, agree that mentorship and, and guidance is, is very, we need it, you know, especially the, the, the sons of Eshu, because we can do great, but we need to know, we need to know what, what direction we're going. You know, we need to know how to do certain things. We can't just figure it out by ourselves. And once we get that guidance, we can be great, but we do need that, that mentorship. And it has been great. It has been good, you know. Um, my mother, me and her are a team in real estate. And, uh, Lead team pros, baby. That's right. <laughs> Progress. Yeah, we're coming in. And um, I'm learning a lot. Learning, you know, almost every day something new, you know. Um, thinking about getting into luxury real estate, by the way. Very nice. Yeah. I hope to be on that contract. <laughs> get a percent you know just give me 0. 0.013 mils you know yeah. but um yes yeah, it's, it's gonna be fabulous things i mean when you look at especially you because a lot of people are gonna recognize you because you ran the store you know those first i mean you were here between i think year two to year four you know before you started delving into other things um people loved you people ask about you all the time um, and the one thing me and your mother always talk about is, you know, how people would just kind of unravel in front of you, you know, Hey, this is my situation. This is what I'm going through. This is what I'm living like and getting your advice and you being a listening ear, you know, it was, it was really incredible because you were, I think 19, 20 when you were here and some of these people were twice your age, you know, asking you for advice. Do you find yourself in that position a lot where people are just talking to you? For you to listen and ultimately guide them, you know, be that mentor. Yeah, yeah, one one hundred percent. Um, I feel like um, I'm a easy person to talk to, you know. Um, I'm one of those people that a lot of people like to talk to. I listen, and if if they if they want my advice, they'll get my advice. Um, so spiritually, when I was here, yeah, a lot of people did come to me, and you know, I love, you know, everybody that came from to me, you know, and. Maybe it's still looking for me. I don't know. Some of them do. Some of them get very angry because they think we fired you. You quit. Yeah. You resigned and moved on to, you know, your real estate and whatnot. But, you know, they're trying to find a way. So maybe you, when you guys start your channel, you know, be on the lookout for that. That way they can get in contact with you. But at that point, it's more real estate consulting. You know what I'm saying? But, you, yeah, I don't know. You might start a life coaching, things like that. But it was really incredible because people would literally, you know, I'm. it was funny because it got to a point where no one knew who I was. They were like, uh, hey, guy, you know, where's Danny? You know what I'm saying? And I have to be like, okay, he's over there, you know. So it was it was really beautiful. But Eshu was a listener. You know, when you look at Eshu, um, he's a cement head. He's not going to say a lot, you know, but he's always listening. You know, you look at Odu's like your grandfather. He was at the Gudang. That's where Eshu started living behind the door and everybody would talk to him. You know, Dio Moni was where Elegua would sit on a rock on the corner and he would just ponder things and people would talk to him. It's very natural for you guys, you know, because even though you have a lot to say, even though you speak well, it's like, you know, it's always y'all's first instinct, let me listen. And that could be really, that's a power move. It really is because I tell you the most successful people I know are listeners, you know, so... I tell you, it makes perfect sense because Elegua would just listen all day, you know? So when we're talking about Eshu, um, Eshu is deceptive because people have him as a child. People have him as, you know, being small. And that could cause a big misconception, 
because Eshu is really the most important deity in the whole religion. Um, I would say even more important than Orula, because without Eshu, Orula can't do anything. And, and Eshu is literally on par with God. So when we look at the human head, the front represents Olodumari, or Ori. But the back, this concept is born in the Odu Beate, represents Eshu. So this part has been scientifically proven to not be able to work unless this part is in balance. So it speaks of how Eshu and God, the light and the darkness, had to always be in balance, right? But people would underestimate him because, once again, just like what happened in Obeyono, they would look at him and his physical appearance was very deceiving. Like They were like, you know, but then when he popped him, they were like, yo, I, I feel like I just got hit by a thousand pound brick. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And I know because I walk in on you guys sometimes and you, you have Demetrius in a headlock. I, I know you, you're getting it in on him. You know what I'm saying? Demetrius is like turning blue and they're like, no, it's okay. You know, and he's dying. You know, dead dead guy in my house. And you know, <laughs> I'm saying, yo, boys, bro. And um, But Otura de Yu was an interesting Odu because Olodumari was dying. And everybody was trying to um, heal him. And no one was getting any luck. So Elegua, seeing an opportunity, he lived in the garbage um, and took a herb that only grew next to the garbage that no one else would have thought of because they were too prideful um, to go to the garbage to look for a solution. He snuck into Olofing's room and fed him the herb, saving his life. When Olodumare hopped out of bed and all the Orishas were like, oh, my God, it's a miracle. He said, no, you guys are idiots. This guy was the one that saved me. And they looked and there's like, there's no way. It was like, yeah, it was the herb and this, that, and the third. And he said, from this point forward, this is the guy that I want. This is my number one option. Don't even talk to me unless we go through this guy first. And just like that, Elegua became the first in line of the Orishas. But once again, he was underestimated. You know, he had all the knowledge. He was just so humble and so reserved, like people overlooked him. So I, I, I ask you, Danny, have you gone through this phenomenon where people – misunderstand or misinterpret you and then all of a sudden you just wow them yeah 100 percent. um so I, we could go back to fighting you know whenever i fight I'm, I'm not the biggest yeah i'm not the biggest i'm 135 you know i'm not i'm not big at all but I'll, i will go against guys who are 190 200 or 170 these guys are way bigger than me there's nobody my size so i am forced to kind of learn the hard way forced to go with the big guys you know and um you know looks could be deceiving so you know they'll, they'll look at me and say how can this guy be on my level and you know i prove them wrong real quick so over and over again you know and whether it's martial arts whether it's business whether any of the things because you you had an interesting situation because um you know what was school like for you um well my early years like Maybe uh, middle school, um, I, I was bullied, um, but school was okay. I wasn't a, a straight A student, but I I knew you know I I had my strong suits. Yeah, and and you know, I I tell you, you really know how intelligent somebody else is when you can't do what they do, right? You know, we, me and you, we joke. You're like, Daddy Fa stuff, I can't do it. And I laugh because I know you can do whatever you put your mind to. But it's in moments when your mother asked me to build, like, one of your sisters, like, I don't know, her playpen. Or, you know, you're building, like, a piece of furniture or things like that. Like, I'm like, dude, I'm lost in the sauce, bro. Like, I'm lost in water. I don't even know how to change a tire. And I'll walk outside and Danny's got his car, his brother's car jacked up and he's under there. You know what I'm saying? Everybody learns differently. I don't have a mechanical mind at all. Like, if it's not a chicken or a chain or me talking about a sign, I'm over with. You know what I'm saying? And that's where people such as yourself come in. And and that's the thing is we live in a time where we feel everybody has to know the same things or fit a stereotype or do the same. If that was the case, we'd be all SOL because what happens when you don't know how to do something that no one else knows how to do? We're done. So, you know, Eshu was kind of like that. He was very, like, he was very, he wasn't, he was, he was unrudimentary. Like, he didn't have a process. He would just kind of wake up and he did things in a way where people were just shocked that he would have a successful result. 
do you notice that with yourself where people are kind of always like, how did you do that? Or, you know, where does that process come from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of those things would be um, a lot of people or that I know would maybe come to me for maybe a, some advice about cars. I'm like a, a, a handyman. I know how to do certain things. Um, so that's a, a certain situation where people may, may come to me and I might be better than them at something that they never maybe thought that they needed. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, when when you look at all dudes like Osala Fobeo, because Eshu was a good guy, but he, he lost his patience a couple times with humanity. And in the Odu of Osala Fobeo was where Eshu would do everything for free. He would help everybody for free. He would take people's balls to heaven for free. Um, and he was happy to do it, but he noticed, like, dude, I have no life. You know, and people would put all their problems on him. And he felt bad, but he's like, I can't keep living like this. So he saw Orula. Orula said he needed to completely switch up his flow um, and start charging for his services, you know. Um and he did that. And then apart from that, he put a nail in his head or a blade so that when people try to put their problems on his head, they would roll off. So when people started going to Elegua again, like to get their free services, they noticed Elegua didn't do it immediately and that it fell off his head. And they were like, Eshu, what's good, man? Come on. Like, yo, let's go. And he's like, hold on, hold on. I need you to pay me and then I'll get to it when I'm ready. And they were like, oh, how could you be like that? You know, ah. he said, look, bro, I've been doing stuff for free for you guys for so long. If you don't want to break me off or you have a problem with it, you can kick rocks. But they couldn't do that because they needed them because they needed to send things to heaven, you know. So they ended up getting with the program and Eshu became a very affluent and comfortable man, you know, as he should have. He performed a very important service. So I ask you, brother, you know, because I know how good you are and I know how you know, supportive you are of the people you know and the people you love. There's nothing people ask of you that you're not capable of doing for them. But, you know, how have you dealt with those situations where, like, damn, I've done everything I could for you up until this point, but the one time I couldn't do it, you switched up on me. You know, have you gone through those situations and how have you kind of reacted to them? Yep, yep, absolutely. I've gone through that. Um, yeah, that, that's a something that I feel like happens with uh, every child of Elegua or, or Eshu because we, we really are too nice. I mean, you know, I like that and that um, analogy you just gave. Um, Elegua told them you're going to have to pay for my services. That's um, a sign where you know your worth. You know, you're not yeah. you're not somebody that does something for free. And um, I could see, though, how that could be hard for us, the child of uh, Eshu, because we're just so nice. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings or tell somebody no. We, we always want to get the job done somehow without kind of um, uh, feeling like we disrespect somebody. So. Yes, yeah, it's, it's an important skill because I think um, the greatest skill every adult will learn how to use is the word no. You know, I think the word no saves more lives than the word yes. I feel like the word no is more productive than the word yes, depending on the situation. And Eshu had to learn that because it's in life, everybody has to put in their work and sacrifice. No one gets a free ride. And Eshu was trying to avoid people having to go through pain because he knew how painful it was to do his job. But at the end of the day, Olodumari told him and Orula told him, people have to go through pain. You can't save everybody. You can't do everything for everybody because if not, you're not going to have a life. You're not going to have a wife. You're not going to be able to provide for your kids. And Eshu quickly caught on um, and got with the program. Until this day, we, we pay a legua. You know, we put the ebo in front of them. We feed them. It is what it is. You know, that's why this guy is so important. In the Odu of Owani Alakentu or Owani Elegibo was where Elegua felt like he was meant for great things. But he wasn't in the position to feel like he was being great. He visited Orula. Divination was done. Owani Alaketu was revealed, where Ifa told him he needed to perform sacrifice to become king and immortal. And Eshu was like, hell yeah, I'm going to do it, bro. You know, I want all that. He did it, and then Orula told him to just walk until he couldn't walk anymore. 
And they're like, well, I was like, damn, bro, I just gave you all this money, the rooster, and, you know, now you're just telling me to go away. Whatever. So I like, well, I started walking. He started going through his pilgrimage of life, and he walked so much that he got tired in a land known as Ketu. When he got there, people started praising him and throwing themselves on the ground to him, and he was like, what's going on? And they said, well, we just did a divination where Awani Alakentu was revealed, where it said that the next man dressed in red and black to come into town, we had to make him king. And just like that, Orula, or Elegua thought about Orula and said, man, I got to thank that guy. And they made him king. And that's why it's known as Owani Alaketu, because Alaketu means the owner of Ketu, or the king of Ketu. And it's a title that's given to Eshu, and there's actually a path of Eshu named after it, right? He thanked Orula, he made Orula his personal Ba'alao, and from then on, all of the sons of Eshu in that land were automatically crowned, you know? I tell you this because, I mean, apart from this podcast, apart from what you're going to do in real estate and all the wonderful things you have planned for your life, have you always felt like you were meant for greatness? Yes. Yeah. Where does that come from? Where Where did those feelings kind of begin? Um... I believe it, it it became a thing for me when when I when I started fighting and and I will be great. I'm not great yet, I'm not there yet, but I will be. It's a process. I will be great, and um, I am meant for greatness. You know. Yeah. And it says that the son of Eshu is gonna have that innately in him. He's gonna have those feelings, because ultimately that's what Eshu became. He became the biggest. He became the most well known. He just and his sons have that DNA. His daughters have that DNA. You know, I look at your sister, Ali, sometimes and like, you know, like she just started an art business. I'm not sure if you bought any of her paintings yesterday. You know, she's like, Joy Poo, I just I just want to give away all my art. I said, you got to make money because that that upstairs penthouse you got, that's not free. So you need to get all that free nonsense. That's got to go because this is expensive. She's selling art to everybody, bro. Like, you know, just the beauty to be able to give that to your children, that entrepreneurial mindset and just stimulate what they already have because no one is going to give you that DNA. You have it already. But just to be the spark to cause that explosion, that's all you guys need, you know? Danny, what would you say to all of the newly revealed children of Eshu or children of Eshu that are watching you right now? What what advice would you give to them um, based on, you know, your experience and what you've been able to learn to make their lives easier? Yeah, um, I'd say uh, one is believe in yourself you know, Actually. because I definitely uh, did not believe in myself in one point in time because um, I had no confidence. I didn't think I was good for anything. And um, now I'm, I'm doing a lot of great things and because I believe in myself because I have that confidence. Definitely believe in yourself. Know that you can do anything that you want. And, um, you know, don't take anything for granted. You know, always uh, be very thankful and uh, good things will happen. And what would what would you say to the people that come incorrect to the children of Eshu trying to you know trying to act out of line? Yeah, I'd say be like careful. Careful. <laughs> be careful. I go Bayono. They don't know when he hit. <laughs> Papi, what a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Um, I love you. I appreciate you being on the podcast and sharing your story. Um. Because I think it is one that a lot of people are going to be able to relate and resonate with and, and garner a lot of value from because it takes a lot of courage and a lot of confidence um, to be able to sit here in front of the world and say, hey, I went through these things. Um, they affected me, but they did not define me. And I don't have to be a product of my past, you know. Um, do you have any last words for the people? Uh, that watch Our Roots podcast in general? Like, what are some of the things that you got going on, you know? Um, well, first of all, if you got time to stop by Botanica Candles <laughs> Bar, definitely go ahead and do that. A little a placement of, right there, a little sponsorship from D. I'm not going to lie. So. Word, word. You, word. Might, you might run into Danny. You might. If you're lucky, you know. You just might. <laughs> like tonight. But um, definitely do that. Come, come by. You might see something you like, even if it's just a look, you know. Um, but... What I got going on, I'm, I'm you know, uh, like at the beginning of the pos- podcast, I'm a professional real estate agent. And I'm an MMA fighter. Just look out for me. I'll be there. Elite Team Eventually. Pros, the MMA thing going on. Definitely, if you want to link up with Danny, all of his socials are going to be in the description. And uh, 
definitely somebody you want to work with and definitely somebody you want to have on your radar. And you're not going to be disappointed because, um, you know, just firsthand accounts, the finest of young men you can encounter right now, especially in a world where, you know, some people aren't, uh, aren't in line or aren't focused, you know. But, Papi, I appreciate you. Wonderful conversation. And uh, until next time, Brody. Yeah, 100%. There you go. For sure. Family, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for tuning in, right? A couple things I want to go over. Botanica Candles and More is up and running for services as well as mentorship programs, products that can be shipped to you, etc. Botanica Candles and More and Our Roots Podcast is available on all major platforms. And our membership program is up and running. Get in there so you can get the most out of us, right? Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thank you. And from Our Roots Podcast, until next time, see the light. Thank you.